we start with a prayer? At least our prayer will be a reading from the letter of James. So, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the letter of James. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and need of food, and one of you say, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, yet does nothing for their body, what use is that? Faith that has no works is dead. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. I say, show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe, in, you believe that God is one. Well, demons believe that. Are you willing to recognize, you foolish, that faith without works is useless? The word of the Lord. Thank you. So, um, that's kind of... That's what? So, um, do you guys, before we start on the final apostles, do you guys have any questions about... Anything math, fuzzy galaxies? Sorry, fluffy. fluffy. They've just discovered fluffy galaxies. Isn't that great? I know. Um, okay, so no questions, no issues? Oh, right. <laughs> so speaking of issues, we're going to start with James the Lesser, which, just FYI, I love these... Uh, titles, James the Lesser, James the Greater, um, in, especially in the Middle Ages when they, you know, Philip the Fair, Joe the Ugly, um, so so James the Lesser, they call him James the Lesser because of one or two things. He was, e well, either younger than James the Greater, or shorter than um, Yes, sir. Well, since they didn't really keep track of birthdays in the ancient world, most likely he was shorter. But as we know, theologically, short people are closer to God. Um, That's correct. <laughs> give me an amen. Um, so, <laughs> um, now, the really odd part about James, I'll admit, admit this, James the Lesser, if you would have asked me a year, year ago, I don't, I would have said, he's the apostle I least like. Um, now, actually, I think he's kind of important. And the odd part is this, is that um, he would have been incredibly well known in the early church. And James the Lesser today is really not that well known, and there's reasons why. Had the early church followed the influence of James more than Paul, Christianity would look a lot more different today. We'd be far more like Judaism in its laws and customs. But really, Paul won out, uh, and James accepted the compromise. Um, but we as a Catholic church would be, have a lot more Jewish um, holdovers. In, the other moniker is that James the Lesser is sometimes called James the brother of Jesus. Um, so this is really interesting. And in the Proto Angelico, it says that James is the brother of Jesus, a son of Joseph from another marriage. And at this point, you're probably asking, the Proto what? Um, the Proto uh, Evangelism. Proto-Evangelism um, is actually supposedly a letter that James wrote. It was highly influenced in the um, early church. has a lot of information in it that we can glean. And it says um, uh, in Genesis 3, the Proto-Angelicum says, in Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers and she will crush your head and you will strike his feet. Um, the proto Angelicum of James, which is also known, I'm going to call this from now on, um, the Gospel of James, is uh, this apocryphal book, uh, 
but it's not in our scriptures. It wasn't considered part of our scriptures. It was written in the second century, a little bit later um, than the Gospel of John, but it's commonly attributed to James the Just uh, or James the Lesser. Um, it was clearly written by another person, um, and it has some odd sources to it, uh, but it can, it's hard to dismiss completely. It gives us a lot of information. There's kind of some kooky stuff in it, um, uh, which is a little kooky, which we dismiss. It's not part of our um, uh, Bible, but the, it's the oldest source that asserts the perpetual virginity of Mary, um, not only before Christ was born, but afterwards. Um, and the other manuscripts that preserve the book have different titles. Uh, another one is the birth of Mary. But the Gospel of James says that um, uh, James is the brother of Jesus. And our Gospels, like Mark, mentions that Jesus has uh, brothers and sisters. And James, the lesser, is in our Bible uh, listed first. So the early sources about these brothers and sisters it could mean cousins, but even scripture scholars would say that would be a bit of a stretch. Um, so the Semitic word for brother could mean a very close family member. Um, but the problem is in Greek, it uses the word brother. So what are we to do with this? Um, so just, I know I've gone over this, but I just want to go over this again. So. Here's the leading theory, and I believe it. Um, remember I mentioned the scenes? In the scenes, um, like in Kumra, they had this community, and there are men, women, a uh, community of men and women, but you also had oblates, and oblates would be people that lived in the world, that had children, but they were connected to an Essene community. Um, <coughs> So what was common is um, if you were a family that you, as let's say, um, uh, yeah, we'll take uh, Julie and uh, Robert. Um, yeah, Robert, I don't know. Rob. Um, I don't know where I got Robert. Um, let's say what would happen is that um, Robert would be a widower with children and Julie wanted to um, be in a scene, but celibacy is unheard of in Judaism. Uh, that's completely unheard of. And what can a woman, you know, a woman's role is to get married. You have another choice than that. That's where you get all your identity. Um, so what they would do is Julie, who would want to make a vow of celibacy, you would marry to an older man who's a widower, um, which means, of course, he had children and it'd be a second marriage. Does that make sense? And it would be quite shocking in that community if the virgin was found pregnant. If she who made a, a vow of virginity is found pregnant. And they had this going on at the time of Christ. And what's really interesting is everywhere that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph live is also an outshoot of uh, an Essene community. Also, if you look at Mary's Magnificat, it's very similar to an Essene. No, sorry. If you look at Mary's greeting to the angel, that's also a greeting that Essenes would give each other, um, which makes it kind of not real proof, but it certainly makes there's too many parallelisms. Does that make sense? So most people think that yes, Mary and was uh, part of this Essene oblate who made this vow of virginity but is found pregnant, and that's the real shocking part. Now, if that's true, then you could interpret uh, all these other children listed in the gospel as brothers and sisters of Jesus, uh, James being the first, as actual brothers and sisters of Jesus. Technically, we would call that stepbrothers and sisters. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, that would be a little controversial. Um, so the question is, um, it also lists James, the son of Alphaeus. And they say that 
James, the son of Alphaeus, is listed among the 12 apostles, and he's James the lesser. So what is that? And here's the part that we really don't, there's a lot of things we don't know about this. Is that, does that mean that there's two James, or one James, or one James with two names? Um, so they call this the ambiguous Jameses, which I always like. Because <laughs> like Mark lists three James. There's James the Greater, the son of Zebedee, um, James the Lesser, the brother of Jesus, and James the Lesser, um, son of Alphaeus. So what, we don't know, just to let you know. Um, the church considers James the Lesser and James the son of Alphaeus as the same person. Um, the Gospel of Matthew doesn't mention any apostle named James that's related to Jesus, um, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't. Um, so just know that there's some ambiguity here. Does that make sense? We'll have to wait until we get to heaven to find out what that means. Um, I'm actually fine with ambiguity. Um, I live most of my life in it. Um, the real important part is that James had a lot of power in the early church. Had a lot of power. He was the first bishop of Jerusalem. Um, and you have to wonder, did they pick him as the first bishop of Jerusalem because he's related to Jesus? Uh, certainly that would have some influence. Now, um, you could say, but I thought Peter was the first bishop of Jerusalem. Well, that is true. Peter was. But remember, Peter would be going on these missions. So who ran the church um, when Peter was out doing missionary work? And it was James. Um, now, what's interesting is that um, you have this fight between James and Paul. And Paul is often misinterpreted as being antinomial. Antinomial means against the law. Um, and do you, like you get Christians today who make an extreme out of Paul's position where they say all you need is faith in your heart. That's all they need. Paul never really says that. That's actually a, a misinterpretation of Paul's position, but you get that among a lot of uh, Christians today. It was kind of started by Luther, um, where Luther over Luther cuts out James from his Bible. I'm going to tell you that, and he overemphasizes Paul's theology by grace, um, where it becomes antinomial. That all all you really need, you don't need to really help anybody or care for anybody, as long as you personally believe Jesus is Lord, that's all you need. Does that make sense? Um, and I like, like, there should be this tension between Paul and James that I think is very healthy. Um, in the letter of James, the one I wrote, James is going to push the opposite of Paul. And I think, as I said, we need a tension between both. James is going to push that what you do with your body matters. That's a very Jewish position. That your acts, your works really do matter. And you can't say, well, I believe that Jesus, no, I believe in God. Because you hear a lot of people say that. I hear a lot of, unfortunately, grandmothers who say that about their grandchildren. Well, they don't go to church or do anything, but they do believe that God. Well, James says, well, the devils believes believe in God, that doesn't make them any good. Does that make any sense? Um, uh, so even Satan knows that there's one God. Um, so knowledge that there is one God, or even knowledge of the catechism, is not the same as acting in faith. And so a very Jewish position would be, um, no, doing things really matters. Caring for the poor, uh, trying to love other people, feeding the poor, it really does matter. So look at Matthew, a very go Jewish gospel. The last judgment in Matthew is Jesus is not going to say, well, what's in your heart? Um, he's going to say, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me drink? When I was oppressed, did you defend me? Those are all things you do with your body. Does that make sense? So I know... We believe that it's a tension between Paul and Jay, because it really does matter what you do in your heart. You know, I could use the other example against James of people that um, 
you know, there's plenty of people who donate to make a big show about, especially politicians, no offense to any politicians in the world room, but you know, always during the presidential election, you will get the standard stock photo of a presidential candidate helping out in the food line for that one day. Um, you know, it doesn't really mean that they care for the poor. It's, and here's the other issue. Um, when I was a, a missionary, I was shocked at this. Like the Catholic Church, we have mis uh, uh, sorry, uh, adoption orphanages all over, and they're huge. Like we have hundreds of children. But now their hands are tied. What's that? I, I think their hands are tied by some of the laws and what we're not supporting. So I heard that. I have no idea what you're talking about. But anyhow, um, <laughs> um, so you go to these third world countries. We have hundreds and hundreds of orphanages with hundreds of kids. And I was kind of shocked because you find these Protestant orphanages with also a couple hundred kids, not as many, but a couple hundred. And it would be, you know, Meridian Baptist Church Orphanage is the sign for that week. And their ministers would fly in and they'd get all these pictures with these starving children. And the next week, it's the Texas Baptist Church. And I don't blame orphanages. I actually don't. I don't blame orphanages for, you know, changing the sign to get money. Um, if you read the book um, Cutting for Stone, yeah. that's what they do as well. That's actually a really odd practice you see. Um, and But the problem is they're using feeding the poor as a photo op for their parish. And I guarantee you, they don't spend much money on that orphanage. Most of it goes for the private jet of the minister. So, you know, ours is, it's the orphanage is the orphanage. You can contribute or not. So my only point being is that if you can get photo ops of people feeding the poor, that really doesn't mean that they have any faith in their heart either. Does that make sense? So, very cynical. Yes, I am very cynical. No, um, that practice is very cynical. Well, that practice is very evil. I really <laughs> do think it's evil. But, so James says, I like the tension that we should have with James and Paul. Too extreme in, in, in any position, the Pauline position or the Jacob, Jacobite position, that's what you'd call it, Jacobite theology. Um, too extreme in any of those ends up in you know, something unreal and ungood. There should be this tension between James and Peter. Now, Peter kind of wins, wins it. Uh, Paul. Oh, what did I say? I meant Paul. Paul and his tension, he basically wins. But um, uh, still, James's theology is relevant today. I wish it was a little bit stronger, that we'd have these emphasis on works of love rather than the feeling of love. I actually think that's very important. Um, James, secondly, really urges care for the poor. You know, and I love that line. Um, if somebody's hungry, you can't say, you know, and this is very crass religious. Keep warm and, God bless you, keep warm and well fed. We'll do something for them. Um, and thirdly, James is right. Faith without works is dead. Um, good and true faith does works. That's our position. So James and Paul actually come to the same point of agreement, but from different perspectives. Um, orthodoxy and orthopraxy should always go together. Orthopraxy is right action. So right thinking and right feeling should go with right action. Um, unfortunately, in my opinion, um, uh, I think the church, well, really, I mean, with Pope Benedict, was more concerned about orthodoxy than orthopraxy. Because, no offense, like one of the worst pedophiles was this guy named Marcel, Father Marcel, who was close friends of Pope Benedict, raped hundreds of children. And Pope Benedict couldn't get his mind around the fact, well, he's orthodox, though. Well, he's orthodox in his answers, but not in his practice. Does that make sense? So you always need a tension between Peter and Paul. Um, now, Paul and James. Paul and James. That was a test you passed. Uh, now, 
if you notice, this is not a strong theology among Protestants. Uh, the Jacobite theology that no faith does works. If you have faith, then you care for the poor, you care for the lost, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's very weak in Protestantism. And the reason why is really with Martin Luther. Um, even though the letter of James is part of the Bible, um, Luther, Luther suffered from scrupulosity, where he was this Augustinian monk, and um, he was had a lot of shame about his sexual desires. So even if he had one sexual thought, he wouldn't go into church. Uh, he wouldn't. He had this constant need to go to confession because he had all these sexual thoughts. Um, and I love his confessor when it says, Luther, Martin, you don't have to confess every time you fart. <laughs> no, no, that's actually true life. Um, and Luther had a lot of um, shame, not guilt, over his sexual thoughts. So um, he called himself like the famous line, I am a worm on the body of humanity. Um, his theology is that the human person in the center of your soul and he does use the German word shit, um, that you're shit. But with the grace of s snow uh, covering it up, our Catholic position would be the opposite. That no, your soul in the very center is something very pure and good. And yeah, we have a lot of, you know, a German word on the outside. Does that make sense? Well, ours is the opposite. So Luther, who suffered from scrupulosity. Scrupulosity is that oh, everything's a sin. And you sometimes get that with people that go to confession. Everything they do is a sin. You know, they've lost any grace. Um, anyhow, he suffered from that. So you can understand somebody who sh suffered a lot of shame and everything is a sin. <clears throat> Suddenly when he reads Paul about, you know, faith is grace, well, that's it. That's all I need. I just have love in my heart. I don't have to worry about my actions. So it's Luther who cuts out and marginalizes James. He cuts it out from Protestant Bibles. And then after Luther broke away from the Catholic Church, you know, then people break away from Luther and then break away again and again and again. So you have this difference between Protestant Bibles and Catholic Bibles. That's one of them. But that's why today Protestants have a very weak Jacobite theology. That doesn't matter what you do with your body. Um, doesn't matter if you feed the poor, as long as you personally believe Jesus is Lord. Just to clarify, James is in the Protestant Bible. No, he's not. <laughs> yes. No, is he really? Yeah. Oh. I mean, Luther wanted to, but other people around him, he wanted to get rid of Hebrews and Revelation and other books, too. No, that's true. James was the big one, but no, he didn't. It's... Are you sure? Because I, I always I look. Know. <laughs> it's no, been 50 I, years as a Protestant. No, no, I'm not doubting you, but I don't think all of them do, because I actually uh, look in Bibles and think, oh, there's no James. That's James and Maccabees is where I look for. No, Maccabees and the Old Testament ones definitely aren't there. <clears throat> James is there. Well, I promise. <laughs> he was marge oh, he was marginalized by uh, Luther. Truly, so. truly. Um, even though he's there, it's... The emphasis is on Romans and a particular take of Romans. Romans. That faith is what matters. That's all that matters. But then you will also hear real faith, though, does work. But it's faith alone, which is kind of saying two things at the same time. But that's kind of difficult. Oh, well, thank you, actually. I, I know Luther and Kevin. Luther also, this is amazing. For somebody who had such concerns about sex, Luther also only has two sacraments, baptism and Eucharist. Um, so he doesn't consider marriage uh, sacrament. Sorry, Charlie and Joe. Um, <laughs> no, but that, that's really weird to me. Uh -huh. He considered people just get married because of the concupiscence of sin out of lust. So that they have a place to direct their lust. Yeah, I think that's really bizarre that you could marry somebody and, and say, well, there's nothing real divine here. Don't you think I mean, the whole sola scriptura and faith alone, and it's just such an emphasis on bringing this down to the bare minimum. And that's kind of how I see the sacraments instead of seven. What's, well, I, I, I can't uh, get away.
away from these two, but everything else is kind of yeah, I do uh, think it's not necessarily wrong That's very or good, evil, yeah. but just not essentially necessary. You know? And then so people break off from that, and by the time you get to some of the evangelical churches, well, long before that, um, communion is there. When it's there, that. it's symbolic, and it's more and more infrequent. Baptism is symbolic, and it's less and less understood or valued. So I think in a generation or two, you know, that not because they really decided theologically that communion's wrong or baptism is wrong, but it'll, I don't know, it just gets less and less. Could, did you guys hear? So, um, Jesus makes the point that, you know, once you start reducing down, it gets reduced down more and more and more to more and more symbolic. And, and the other is... Like, what's the bare minimum someone could do to end up in heaven? And <laughs> anything else is kind of barnacles. You know, the odd part is that theology, the bare minimum you can do to heaven, if you go the other way, to the other extreme, you get... That, to that same position. What's the bare minimum amount of work I have to do to get to heaven? Yeah. Um, sure. So I just kind of think, well, the Catholic Church without James would look so much different. And that's when I, like, I didn't like James because I'm more of a Pauline person. Um, but now that I think about it, without James as a little bit of an anchor, without that tension, we could end up into this reductionism. Yeah. Don't know much about him other than that. We know he's martyred. The story is, is that um, he is clubbed by a scribe, um, which I think is kind of oddly ironic. Um, a scribe is an expert of the law, Jewish law. Um, so there is also a story, and I love this story, that um, James was also known for great piety. In that he spent so much time praying on his knees that they said, quote unquote, um, he had the knees of a camel. Um, <laughs> which, if I just like to mock people. So there's a gal named um, Carol Meadows. Yep. And I want to start calling her Camel Knees because she has so much brain. Um, but I love, you know, I, just, I don't know why, I just love uh, James the Lesser's um, Camel's Knees. Okay, so enough on James. Any questions? I don't know that much. So, but you said that James kind of went with the Jewish law more. Yes. Sorry. And, um, but he was clubbed by a Jewish guy. Uh, scribe. There's the irony. Huh? There's the irony. If yeah. the legend is true, that, you know, it'd be kind of, no offense. It's kind of strange the same way um, Malcolm X, <coughs> who is extremist, yeah. uh, very much pro-black, is killed by a black guy. You know, just more extreme than him. <coughs> Maybe it's like the Muslims that kill all of their own Muslims because they don't think... You're right. It would be like Muslims killing Muslims because they're not extreme enough. So. Yes? So, since you were talking about celibacy being so odd at the time, Jesus never married. Mm -hmm. Was that ever addressed because he was crucified at 33, which would have been old and he should have been married by then? And yet, was that ever addressed as far as that oddity about him? I don't remember anything being addressed by him. The oddity would be if he did get married. But then we would be like the uh, Greek gods, where, for the, no offense, the Mormon god, <laughs> who comes to Earth have to have sex with one of his creatures. Um, but from no, a per Jewish perspective, right. yeah, that's what I meant. Think, wait a minute, what's with well, him? Yeah, exactly. Why isn't he married? Yeah, why are we following? Oh, I see what you mean. Sorry. Yeah, that was my point. Thank you. No, I don't remember any anything like that. So that's very interesting. No, there's nothing like. That. Okay. But um, you know, you have um, in the Old Testament, you have Jeremiah, mm -hmm. which. You know, for that, you know, that's really odd. You have one celibate in the Old Testament, that's Jeremiah. And then you have, in the New Testament, John the Baptist and Jesus. Now, nobody thought it was odd about John the Baptist because, once again, they think John the Baptist 
was connected to an insane community. These crazy people committed. And so maybe they thought the same thing of Jesus. I, I really don't know. I'm okay. just guessing. But what's that? Joseph and Mary were insane. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't know for sure they were insane. Um, I said it's only a guess. Um, but look at John the Baptist. He comes from the desert where the scenes are. He wears this, and he has a lot of scene image as well. So. I thought it was just the women that were um, John the Baptist. Maybe we're too. Well, that's a problem. It's a, <laughs> it was, well, no, no, but like, no, there's, believe it or not, there's celibates in the church today. But <laughs> celibates don't give birth to other celibates. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> it's a belief. Let's take it off. But did Jesus die in Jerusalem? Supposedly, but we're really not sure. We don't know. Um, James the Greater, no. Yeah, no, James the Greater was, too, yeah. James the Greater. Uh, son of Zebedee. So, but James the, the Lesser, he did die in Jerusalem by King Agrippa. That's at least what the legend says. Okay, anything else? Okay, so Matthew, Matthew over there. Oh, okay, so Matthew's over there. Um, doesn't matter. So the name Matthew is Greek for gift of God. Um, this is the odd part. He too is called son of Alphaeus. What that means, we don't know. Um, and he's called to be an apostle while sitting uh, as a tax collector in Capernaum. Um, now, technically, and this is just a little technique, he technically wasn't a tax collector. He was a, a poll collector. And so the Romans had, but you know, in church, we just say tax collector because that's our nomenclature. But the Roman government had uh, two systems for gaining revenue. One was tax collecting, where it's a due amount. It's a set amount. Does that make sense? So when you, I don't know, uh, get a fishing license, that's a set amount. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Then they have these more toll collectors that... Um, uh, Sorry, I thought it was a bad analogy. So um, <laughs> the bad analogy is this, like the diocese. The diocese has their annual Catholic appeal. So what they do is come up with their budget, then divide their budget among the registered parishioners, and you get this allotment of the budget. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And you just pay it. Um, so it's just kind of this, to me, odd system. They don't. They just come up what they want, and then they give us the bill, and we're forced to pay for it. Does that make sense? Um, that's more like toll collection, where let's say I'm the Romans. I'm going to make Rob um, say, Rob, this is how much I want you to get from the people. So let's say it's a million. So Rob, of course, is going to squeeze people for two million and keep a million for himself. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. So. Now, that was, so imagine, that's a very hated position. It's not just, yeah. it's not tax collecting where it works by a percentage or some set amount. They're trying to gouge you as much as they can. Um, so, what's that? Um, so, he would have been incredibly hated as a tax collector. Um, now, as a tax collector, he would have been uh, literate. So, you know, we know John and Peter are illiterate, it says that in the Bible, but most likely Matthew was literate because he would need to be to do business. Um, and Peter calls him, sorry, Jesus calls and invites him to a feast. And on seeing this, that Matthew is invited to a feast with Jesus, um, the Pharisees criticize him that he eats with tax collectors and sinners. Now, in Mark and Luke, he's identified as Levi. Um, so you remember there's different lists of the apostles, so we think Levi and Matthew are the same person because it's the same story. Of course, he's the patron saint of uh, bankers and bureaucrats. Um, his, uh, the most apostles, you know, went out on mission um, 
Irenaeus, who's a very good source, um, he writes that him and Clement of Alexandria claimed that um, Matthew preached the gospel to the Jewish community in Judea. Um, there's some other sources that disagree with that, but that's two really good sources. He died as a martyr. Um, did he write the Gospel of Matthew? Well, that's a yes and no answer. I've gone over that before. He was probably the source for it, but we know that it went through redactions, uh, editing. By, in what we know now is the Gospel of Matthew it would have been finished around 85 AD, but there would have been um, a earlier version. So it probably started with Matthew, then was redacted. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, that's Matthew. It's a, his gospel is very, very Jewish. Um, so clearly, if our two early church sources are true that he preached in uh, Judea, that would make sense because uh, he's preaching to the Jews, and his gospel is very Jewish. Um, any questions there? Not that I know that much, but... Okay, the next one is Andrew. Um, Andrew is there. Um, Andrew, ah, I just like this. His name in Greek means manly, so I just think that's kind of funny. Um, his name means manly. The New Testament states that Andrew was a brother of Simon Peter, uh, by which it's inferred that... Um, Likewise, he's the son of John, Barjona. He lived in the village of Bersidi on the Sea of Galilee. Um, he was a fisherman like his brother. He has uh, the moniker, uh, the first disciple call, because if you remember, um, in Matthew and Mark, uh, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew are both together. And Jesus says, together, he'll make them fishers of men. Um, there's another story where, um, uh, uh, in contrast, John, John um, states that Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist, who first led his testimony to Andrew, and another undisciple to follow Jesus, you know, where he says, there is the Lamb of God, so Andrew follows him, and then later gets his brother Peter and say, we have found the uh, Messiah. So you have two different calling stories. Does that make sense? <coughs> one with in the boat with Peter, another one where he's a disciple of John the Baptist, he follows Jesus, then goes and gets Peter. What's the truth? I don't know, I consider both of them true, but obviously we don't have the interlinking story. Does that make sense? Um, so if you say, if a trivia question is, who's the first apostle call? The answer would be for us, um, Eusebius says uh, Eusebius is a very good source uh, and Origen Origen was an early church theologian, loved his stuff that um, Andrew preached in Scathia and the Chronicles of Nestor adds that he preached along the Black Sea uh, and went as far as Kia, which I, you know, we don't really know it's true, but um, my only point is that Andrew is a patron saint of Ukraine, uh, Romania, and Russia for that reason. Does that make sense? Because he went clear up to the Black Sea. So those countries he's a patron saint of. The early text of, um, called the Acts of Andrew, known to Gregory of Tours, described that uh, Andrew was a martyr. He was bound, not nailed to a cross. Um, <coughs> which sometimes actually did happen, we found that historically. Um, and yet another tradition says that um, he was crucified on a cross, but on the side, so it would be an X shape. Does that make sense? Um, so now, you guys have seen the flag where, uh, like, what is it, Norway? One of those countries up there, um, or the Ukraine, they have an X. It's blue and white and it's an X, that's the St. Andrew's cross. Does that make sense? Or if you look at the uh, Southern Confederate flag, it's a St. Andrew's cross, which is always, uh, the Confederate flag always benotes or connotes the uh, KKK. But our, 
Are you waving at me or do you have a question? I have a question. Could you get me a cookie? I don't know. I didn't write down what his feast day is. Is that the feast day? Well, that, yeah, it is. And I, we started a Christmas novena that day, uh, Christmas Eve. Oh, I did not know that. So when's his feast day? November 30th. I don't know if that's the same end, same end. Close enough for me. <laughs> um, so that's when Midge starts, sorry, Midge, Marge starts praying for Christmas presents. On St. Andrew. Um, so, oh, so the St. Andrew's Cross, as I mentioned, um, it's the form of uh, uh, the Confederate flag. So when I was um, uh, up at Moscow, they had this school that I just really disliked. It was a private school. Um, and the private school, I came to find out that the pastor, this is kind of strange, the pastor um, wrote this little pamphlet for his congregation called, um, I forget what it was, but it was that slavery didn't exist in the deep south. There wasn't, no, seriously. And think about this. The name of their school was St. Andrew. The color was a Confederate red. So when I, when it was St. Andrew, it's like, oh, it's not this St. Andrew. It's a St. Andrew f Confederate flag. Does that make sense? God, no. Uh, no, no, no. It's an evangelical school. But, so basically, they're from the South, and that's when I thought, oh, St. Andrew. Got it. Because it's not the apostle they're interested in. It's the Confederate flag. So, any questions about St. Andrew? Okay, so last, St. Thomas. Um, really, I don't, the odd part is we really don't know that much about the um, apostles, as I said. It's kind of scant in some places. Thomas, um, he appears also in the gospel. He's called. There's three stories of him going over quick. One is that um, he's the first to speak in the God, speak up, I should say, in the Gospel of John, where in John, when Lazarus had died, and the apostles, uh, they don't want, want to go back to Judea because it says that some of the Jews were looking for an occasion to stone Jesus. And Jesus decides to go back to Judea. And it's then Thomas is the one who said, let us go so that we can all die with them. My point being is that, keep that in mind. It's Thomas who, um, in my opinion, is the brave one, who doesn't shrink away from uh, dying with Jesus. Then you have John 14, um, where Jesus says the line, um, it's, um, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places, if there are not, how uh, would I say that I'm going to come back and take you to myself so that where I am, you may also be. Now, you know I've mentioned this several times, it's important to know that's actually wedding language, but Jesus uses it as this image that at our death, he will come back and take me to um, myself so that where I am, you may also be. Heaven is pictured as this wedding banquet. Jesus uses this imagery, and Thomas says something really stupid. He says, we do not know the way. <laughs> Um, he's not getting the poetry. Um, and the most famous line of um, Thomas is that after the resurrection, he on Sunday skips Mass. Always bad to skip Mass. Um, when he comes back and the apostles say, you missed it. You know, Jesus appeared at the breaking of the bread. And Thomas gives that famous line, I will not believe it unless I probe the nail marks in his hand and put my hand into his side. And um, anyhow, so I just want to preach on this for a minute. It drives, drives me up the wall when people call Thomas Doubting Thomas. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it drives me up the wall, because the theology there is, um, and you'll notice this a lot in argument or in Roman documents, that they confuse knowledge of the faith with faith in the sense that um, if all Thomas needed was a good catechism, and if you don't know your catechism, then you're a doubter. Actually, I consider doubt a very important theological tool. I really do.
to ask questions and doubt. So yes, Thomas asked a stupid question. We don't know the way. But if you don't understand what Jesus is saying, because Jesus speaks in poetry, and you know, the Bible is mostly poetry. You can't just read it like an instruction book. And I, you get that a lot in country songs that drive me up a wall. It's not an instruction book, it's, it is, but it's poetry. You really have to ask a lot of questions, and Thomas does. Um, and yes, Thomas skips um, the breaking the bread, but he's not doubting, he's asking the hard question. And um, it makes it sound like asking Hard questions is a form of doubt. How do you know asking questions is not a form of faith? And you get this whole doubting Thomas among the certain strand that believe that you know all you need for religious education is this kind of textbook, or what's called manual theology. Manual theology is just you read the manual and we have all the answers, and you memorize the answers, and therefore you have faith. Does that make sense? And even like there's a story, uh, this guy who, um, interesting story, he gets kind of kicked out, he's older generation, he gets kicked out of uh, Catholic school because he kept asking too many questions. But, you know, the authorities, they, he asks questions that they can't answer. Does that make sense? So rather than look for the answers, they kick the kid out of school. Um, that's actually this so concerned about orthodoxy that you just give the right programmed answer back, not that you think about the questions. Does that make sense? Um, I think questions is very important. So when people say doubting Thomas, what they're really under underlining is that theology that you shouldn't ask questions. The first quote from Thomas is that let us go die with him, proves that he's brave. Why don't we call him brave Thomas? Why don't we ask Call him Thomas, who asked the really hard questions. Um, not doubting Thomas. I, I think that misses the whole point of his life. And when he says, I will not believe without probing the nail marks in his hands, um, that's actually just a profound statement. The nail marks are marks of injustice and cruelty. And remember, when Christ appears resurrected, he always is with the nail marks and cut his side meaning that Christ is suffering now. So the question, translating the poetry, would be this. If you people say that Christ is risen, show me where Christ is risen in the marks of injustice and cruelty in the world, which there's plenty of that. Um, it's easy to celebrate Easter when we have everybody in pretty dresses and the colored eggs outside, but how do you celebrate Easter when people are starving to death or dying in silly wars. Does that, you know, that's the hard question Thomas is asking. Um, so yes, it drives me up the wall when people say, he should be the patron saint of people who ask hard questions, brave and hard questions. Um, his name Thomas means twin in Aramaic, um, Didymus in Greek. Um, now, here's a lot of ink has been spilled on this. Thomas is a twin. His name is Jude Thomas, by the way. Um, there's so many Judases that he's called Thomas. Uh, so Jude the twin, but um, who's his twin? It's never really stated. So the question is, are you, like in Greek literature, it's trying to figure out like, are they saying that you're supposed to be Thomas's twin, twin and ask hard questions? Um, the Gnostics, not a very good group, in my opinion, um, they come up in later Christianity. They would say that actually the twin of Thomas is Jesus. Um, I find that incredibly goofy. Um, or maybe he was just a twin. Maybe there is no meaning there. Maybe it was just a twin. Does that make sense? That Thomas means twin. His feast day is the 21st of December. Um, it's kind of strange. Um, it's kind of strange because in the early church, it was the 3rd of July. Um, but in 1969, it was transferred, so it wouldn't interfere with Advent. Um, I just think that, like, and I only mention that because that always irritates me. Uh, it irritates me because 
But, you know, I want to celebrate the Feast of St. Thomas when the early church celebrated the feast. I don't really care that it interferes with Advent. Does that make any sense? So I think in this foolish move, they transferred it. Um, let's see. There is this uh, heretical work called the Passing of Mary, uh, and it was declared heretical in 494. Um, and it's kind of interesting because um, it's at the Assumption of Mary. It says Thomas is the only witness. Um, and he was miraculously transported to Jerusalem so he could witness her death and her assumption into heaven. Um, so sometimes you'll hear people quote that Thomas was the one who saw Mary's assumption. Don't say anything. Just do what I do, which is the most polite and think, no, that's a heretical hex. Um, so just kind of interesting. Here's the interesting part. So Thomas, um, and I actually believe this. Uh, it said that Thomas did his missionary work in India, that he sailed in 52 AD and spread the faith uh, to the port of Merceros, where there was actually this Jewish community. And the, the, port, the port was destroyed in 1341 due to this massive flood. Um, and I love this. So the ancient custom is that uh, Thomas established the seven and a half churches in that area. And what I love about that is, what's a half a church? <laughs> <laughs> he established seven and a half churches. I don't know what that means. I just find that so funny. Um, but if you talk to people from India to this day, like I need two Indian priests who proudly proclaim they came from this area, that their faith is descended from St. Thomas. That's actually quite, like the Irish, we're converted quite early, but really that still is the third century. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> parts of India was converted by Thomas. Um, and St. Ephraim, the Syrian, he also states that Thomas was martyred in India. Um, now, so there are communities that do swear that they um, are, are descended from Thomas, but there's also this uh, tradition that he died in, I think, uh, was martyred in um, Armenia. But all the traditions, all the resources that are trackable say India. So, yeah. Well, is it possible that we're supposed to be a second part of the twin? Is it possible that we're supposed to complete that half church, like that's the passing on to us, the responsibility of it? Um, well, yeah, but that church wouldn't have been, uh, he would have... Not the, physical church, but the idea of... Yeah, but they wouldn't have known the same thing, because, like, the apostles, wouldn't, when writing the gospel, mm -hmm. wouldn't know what happens to Thomas on his missionary activity. It's a nice poetic thought, but... Um, once he left, it would have been near before they got information on Thomas. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um... So there, you often hear this thing called the Gospel of Thomas. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah. Um, it is not part of our scriptures. It's Gnostic. Technically, it's called Docinistic, um, or Docetism. Um, and that's a heresy that says that, well, Jesus was the Son of God, but he was never completely human. He only came in a form that looked human. Does that make sense? Um, that he really didn't suffer, that he only took on the appearance, the image, but he really didn't take on the flesh of human beings. Um, so in the Gospel of Thomas, you get this weird stuff of um, like Jesus' childhood, when um, Joseph is cutting boards, even though it doesn't, anyhow, he's cutting boards, and Jesus, uh, one day, um, Joseph cuts a board too short, and Jesus miraculously makes the board grow, that's not a miracle, that's magic. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that they have is really in the, the Gospel of Thomas magic. Now, here's the interesting part. The, like the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke use what's called the Q source. You guys know what the Q source is? 
So the Q source would have been just a list of the sayings of Jesus. So if you look at the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, um, Jesus has the same words, but set in different settings and things. Some of the words change, but clearly um, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke used the Q source and the Gospel of Mark and came up with kind of different ones. But also the Gospel of Thomas, whoever wrote it, had the Q source, uh, but then added a bunch of other things. Um, also, not only does um, Syrian tradition say that Thomas's name was Judas Thomas, but oddly enough, the Gospel of Thomas says uh, uh, his name was Judas Thomas. But it's filled with all this docetism that Jesus only appeared human. Um, now, it has some other goofy stuff to it, too, because a lot of New Age people uh, love to quote the uh, Gospel of Thomas because it says things like, um, Thomas, Jesus says in the Gospel of Thomas, the greatest love of all is to love yourself. The problem is, in the Gospel of John, the greatest love of all would be um, to know love itself, which is God, to love God and your neighbor and yourself. Does that make sense? So. It's very new agey to say the greatest love is to love yourself. So they don't quote the Gospel of Thomas, even though it objects with the Gospel of John. Um, and if they quote, if you get any new agers and that quote the Gospel of Thomas, what I like to do is say, well, the Gospel of Thomas also says that uh, for you to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to become a man. And that Jesus changed Mary Magdalene into a man. So, yeah. Like, I know I'm kind of rude, but as soon as you quote the Gospel of Thomas, and usually, no offense, it's always a woman who's a New Ager, and good luck on that sex change operation. Um, <coughs> what's that? When was that supposedly written? Third century. Really? Third or fourth century, nobody really knows, yeah. So they dug that up from somewhere. I know, I love that, yeah. The other, um, the other thing is, um, the Gospel of John clearly has a lot of anti-docetistic language in it. Like, you notice how in the Gospel of John, um, Thomas wants can touch his flesh and touch his wounds, or when Jesus is on the beach, um, he says, do you have something? I am not a ghost. I have flesh and blood. And uh, do you have, Jesus says, do you have anything to eat? That Jesus is really real, not just this floating image. Um, that's very anti-docetistic. Or um, the beginning of Gospel of John, when it says the word became flesh, there's several words for flesh in Greek. I could use the word body, but by body I mean like we're all one body. Or I could use the word body as like my body, my flesh, with means, uh, you know, blood vessels and hair follicles and all that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says this is my body, uh, it means different than... Uh, when it says the word became flesh. When it says flesh, it means flesh and blood. That's very anti docetistic So if you notice, the Gospel of Thomas disagrees a lot with the Gospel of John, but they want it to be very docent, um, docetic. Now, what's interesting is um, if Thomas uh, started this community in India, which most of us believe, um, what's interesting is that this community in, in India has no dosis, do, dosatistic tendencies. So if the Gospel of Thomas is really from Thomas, then the community he started would have had dosis, dos, these beliefs, <laughs> um, these antibody beliefs. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they don't. Um, okay, enough of that. So you do get these strings. Um, things. Um, also, um, in the Gospel of Thomas, I love this one, Jesus makes mud pies and then blesses them and turns them into birds. Um, uh, that's actually from the uh, infancy of Thomas. Now, the problem is that's magic, not miracles. There's a huge difference between magic and prayer. So. Yeah, it does seem more like a children's book, yeah. 
I want a clarification here. Because when you were talking about the Greek word for flesh, when the word became flesh, and then you said the Eucharist, he said body, wouldn't he have said flesh? If oh, oh, yes. But, um, yeah, it's, sorry. Um, there's a word for, I messed up, very big. There's a word for living flesh, like this is my living body, um, versus, um, I forget the word, corpse. Does that make sense? So, when so he, he said, this is my corpse? No, no, that's my point. <laughs> oh, he did not say that. Um, it would be translated living body. Oh, okay. okay. So. I'm just a little... So Thomas knew Jesus. Yes, he was an apostle. So, but he denied Jesus was Lord Jesus. No, 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 sorry. That's in the fake gospel. What was the question? That's, uh, he, said, he said, so she thought I was saying that Thomas was saying that Jesus was fake. This just this image. No, that's what's called the Gospel of Thomas. I'm just mentioning this because we're on Thomas. Yeah. That people will say that there's this Gospel of Thomas, but really because that came so later, it disagrees with the other apostles. It disagrees with the community. That so anybody with half a brain does not believe the Gospel of Thomas is actually a canonical. But you you have a lot of New Agers who love Thomas for this reason. So it wasn't sourced by Thomas? Or Thomas no, not at all. Uh -huh. And it wouldn't have, so I probably shouldn't have mentioned that because I confused you, but no offense. If you meet a new ager and they say that their favorite apostle is Thomas, <laughs> it's not really Thomas, it's a Thomas of their own making. <laughs> James Greater, son of Zebedee. So Spain is connected with James the Tall, not James <laughs> the Tiny. The Tiny. Well, he was, he was beheaded, though, so. You're right, he lost them. <laughs> so that's what happens to tall people. <laughs> so. Oh, yes, doctor. Um, what would be the meaning of uh, the word I have no touch here and what hand is the Father yet? I have not ascended to the Father. <coughs> I have not ascended to the Father. Um, what that means is don't cling to me is, sorry, I'm eating a cookie. Um, <laughs> You know how a lot of people want to put Jesus in this little tiny box that he's just like I want to see him. Does that make sense? They're clinging to him. They're putting him in a box, except Jesus is due to ascend to the Father beyond time and space and even beyond our understandings. Um, so that he's beyond time and space. But Mary wants to cling to him just as she knows him. Does that make any sense? It's like, and I'm not kidding. I've gotten in arguments with people that Jesus was not blonde. You know, blonde. They are clinging to this image. Yeah. What's that? Clearly, he was a redhead. Um, no, he was a red. Have you ever checked that baby Jesus that Mary's holding in the church? He's a ginger. He's a ginger. Um, but they cling to these images that I, you know, let Jesus ascend. Does that make any sense? Okay, now I'll, I'll, I'll say something controversial. Um, you? <laughs> no, I'm just trying. Okay, so you know, like the same way you want to cling to only a certain image of Jesus, but he ascends beyond those. Um, I was talking to this new ordained priest who I and I don't want to be careful with this because uh, I'm not really that pro, but anyhow, he's very anti-woman's ordination. And so he says, 
Jesus only selected men. Jesus was a man, and he only selected men. Well, in some ways, that you're like Mary Magdalene, <coughs> clinging to this certain e image. And so I said, yes, but Paul said, in Christ there is neither male nor female, Greek or Jew. So I, I said, the early apostles all wore beards, too. They're all Jewish. Does that mean everyone who's named a bishop has to have a beard and be Jewish? Like, like how far are you going to cling to that image? Um, I'm not really saying that I'm pro-women's ordination. I, but, like, you cling to this certain image of Jesus that Jesus has to be what I want him to be. But maybe he's ascended beyond that. He came from that. He took on human form for 33 years. But Christ is more than just that. I could be wrong, but I doubt it. But, <laughs> no, but the Mormons do the same thing, that Jesus is a blonde. You know. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, look at the pictures. <laughs> I know. That's why I'm going to do it. No, why you're a <laughs> Any other questions at Barb? Yeah. To me, the, the difference is that um, Jesus is the, you know, the foundation and the head of our church as a father, representing the father, God the father, and a woman cannot be a father. That's where I separate oh, ordination. Oh. The only problem with that is that, um, really, um, as Augustine says, when it says God the Father, it doesn't mean that he's male. Yeah. Father and Son speaks about relationship. Um, that the Trinity is a perfect, loving relationship. Yeah. God is neither male nor female. This says in the Bible, God is male. We use male and female imagery to describe relationship, not the biology of God. She likes everything in a box. It's really neat. <laughs> really? I don't see you that way. Is she really that way? She is. Oh my God, I saw you that way, not her. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be honest, this is my problem. This really is my problem. Um, I like everything in a box. So, I mean, I might be saying this stuff that, you know, you shouldn't cling and you know, but in all honesty, I'm very much that way. It drives me up a wall at the gym when somebody puts a 10 pound weight next to a 25 pound. The 25 pound goes with the 25 and the 10 goes with the 10. Um, and I will often, I know I'm almost like, um, what's that special needs children that eat up? Uh, I'm, no, I'm a little Asperger-y where in my, when I'm not working out, like taking a break, I'll rearrange the weights because they drive me up the wall when the tens are with the tens and the twenty five with the twenty five. Oh, I, it's called issues. We're back to many issues. Okay, so the next thing we want to do. Sorry, this was apostles. Um, it was the best shot. Um, so you guys asked for it. The next thing we're going to do in adult ed is uh, just something on Pope Francis. Um, because he's coming to the United States, so um, the only problem is I don't have a lot of work to... So we're going to start, that's going to be our next adult ed, will be Pope Francis. Um, and I'm not really sure how to do this. So what I was going to do, like with my classes, one would be his life. The other one would be Joy of the Gospel, his first statement. Um, I'd have another class on his theology of the church, and then his just teachings, which gets a little blurry. One affects another. Does that make any sense? So I was just thinking, you know, there's so much. I used to have this website of this daily update on Pope Francis, but after like a month, it's like, I just don't have time. Um, so, but it, you know, he says so many things that I love because they're, um, uh, what do you call that? Um, when you love say things it. to be... Yeah. Well, he, he says a lot of provocative things uh, that often are hyperbolic, um, but they're controversial. Like, And I love this, what he said, 
couple weeks, like two weeks ago, when he ordained the young priest, where he said, stop giving boring homilies. Like, I love a pope that says, stop giving boring homilies, and stop prancing around like peacocks. You, know, you go, no, because like for the newly ordained, that's going to hurt them, especially the ones in Rome, because they all have Roman collars and gold cufflinks. And, um, like, you see the newly ordained in the Diocese of Idaho, when they show up, they show up with gold cufflinks because, you know, that's what Jesus wore. Um, and then you have the, um, then you have the older priests who, I just love the older priests, I really do love the older priests, who are, um, there's always this tension between the young priests and the older priests, in case you didn't know. Um, with the older priests, they often don't wear clerics, they definitely wear you no know, gold. Um, one of our older priests, uh, he's an Italian down at St. Mary's. Um, he's crazy. Um, but I, he doesn't care for any of that stuff. Any, none of the retired priests like you know, the rigor um, uh, gold cufflinks and stuff like that. So he literally can fit everything he has into a backpack. He keeps no possessions. He, his spare money goes to this orphanage that he helps support. Um, like a lot of the older priests, they don't want things, they're not interested in titles, um, they don't care about gold cufflinks. Um, so it's really odd that you have this pope that is so provocative towards, and I have to admit, when I got ordained, <coughs> guess what I bought? <gasps> yes, I did, because you know, I don't know why, but when, like, <coughs> That's what you did, yeah. Because that's, that's what, that was what you, you know, I, I had a certain image of priesthood, you, you know, like you wanted to be very polished, and, um, and the older you get, the less you care about gold cufflinks. Um, now, the funny part, I spent all this money on gold cufflinks, but I never bought a cleric that actually has oh. gold like, I and so I never got a chance to wear them, and now I have no idea where they are because I would cash them in. But like, like just Mueller and Dave are concerned about more pomp, and I just think it's hilarious that you have this pope who, so overnight um, in Rome, once Pope Francis became pope and it was clear that he didn't want to wear the Copa Magna and all this other stuff, Suddenly, all the cardinals talk about lemmings, and all these people. The next day, everybody stopped wearing gold cufflinks. Um, so I thought we would do. So there's so many stories that way. So does that vary from order to order? So orders usually don't wear gold cufflinks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Priests don't take about poverty. We live. <laughs> but I thought what we could do is, uh, and I'll mention this before Mass, before one of my, bring an article either on his ecclesiology or his teachings, and we'll cover it that class. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's just a way of getting excited about. And also as a way of, like, and I'll try to do this, contrast him to uh, Pope Benedict. And the reason why I want to do that is that you know, with each pope, people, I think this is actually kind of true. We had such a long papacy with John Paul II mm -hmm. that people assume that every pope take is like every other pope. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, John the Twenty Third and Paul, they're all quite different and their teachings differ. Does that make any sense? And so um, the pope after Francis is going to be probably you know, much different than Francis. So, and I just kind of think, rather than be like lemmings and the next day just give up, just, uh, When are you going to do this? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm gone next week. I'm going to go visit a friend. Then the week after that, we have convocation, so I won't be here. Um, so I know, I, I don't, yeah, I, that would be the second week of June that I think it starts, but you really don't want to trust my memory when it comes to dates. I, it's supposed to be on the, it's supposed to be on the church website. So. 
Rob? Um, I've always looked at Thomas. I've always, I've always taught him to my, my CCD kids uh, as, as the one apostle of childlike faith. That his faith is very simple, it's very practical. Uh, and I don't want to go too deep into this, but it's like, you know, let the little children come to me, Thomas actually comes to me. But also, little kids always ask the tough questions. Well, that's an interesting insight. I mean, there are things like, like why, why, why? I mean, that, that's a profound question. Yeah. And Thomas, I've always called Thomas believing Thomas. This doubting Thomas thing, I think that is never kind of So Rob said something interesting I never thought of because I don't have children. But um, he says, Thomas reminds him of a child because children always ask why, why, why. And children are very tactile. They want to touch things. So that's actually an interesting. But, it, but it's the difference between childish and childlike. Right. So I think the faith should be innocent. I'm hoping to work towards me. <laughs> why do you look at Julie? <laughs> Poor Julie. Let's all close to the prayer for Julie. <laughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning.